Hi, I'm Bill Stuthers. I'm the chair of the board of Post Polio Health International. And I want to talk today about self-advocacy and community advocacy. The history of advocacy among people with disabilities is rich and varied, and polio survivors have played a critical, prominent role in this effort. I'm going to tell you my story of my arrival at self-advocacy and growth into community advocacy. I hope that my story will resonate with you and encourage you on your own journeys. If you, like me, became disabled as a child, your mother and or your father probably were the first advocates you encountered. Whether you knew it or not, their efforts to get the best treatment and care for you provided a model of advocacy that very likely imprinted on you. I know that my parents, particularly my mother, right off the bat rejected medical advice to put me in an institution as the extent of my polio paralysis became clear. I was scared, wondering what had happened to me, what was going to happen next, thinking I must have done something bad or wrong. I'm sure that I absorbed the negative attitudes of the medical staff that my life was so over and useless that I should be hidden away in some institution and forgotten. It took years to overcome these feelings. My parents, I'm also sure, were distraught, wondering what they could have done to prevent this from happening, blaming themselves, each other perhaps, or even God. But they vowed to do all they could for me. They, they fought to get me into rehab and to get surgeries that will give me a better chance at becoming more independent. Over a period of three years, I spent months in different facilities, each of which helped me to develop skills, to get in and out of bed, or even to dress myself. Of course, not everything succeeded. All the efforts to put me in leg braces so that I could walk again came to nothing. I was never able to struggle more than a few yards on crutches. My arms and body just did not have the strength to carry me. I was destined to live in a wheelchair. But that was not going to keep me from going to school. First, the small two-room elementary school close to my home agreed to let me work my way back up to grade, part-time at first, after missing two and a half years of real classroom work. Getting to high school was a tougher fight. It was 10 miles away by a school bus. The school had no one else in a wheelchair. Three floors, no elevator, and school administrators wary and resistant to accommodating me. But my mother debated, argued, and cajoled with the principal, and they worked out a plan so that I took all my classes on the first floor. Ultimately, my peers grew big and strong enough so that they could carry me in my chair up and down the stairs. At the time, I was not so appreciative of my mother's great efforts. I was, thanks to my parents, pretty much like other kids. I had chores at home and was a troublesome teenager too. But deep inside, I was aware that my mother advocated for me and that because she fought and pushed for me to be included in the education system, doors opened for me. That was an important learning. She was a strong role model for me, even if it took time for me to appreciate that it was possible to get what you need if you made the case and persisted. When I went away to college, again with her advocacy to get me a place in a residential college, I got the attendant help I needed, especially toileting and showering, which I was still unable to do on my own. Again, my mother did the groundwork to win the active support of the residence dean. As one of only a few wheelchair users in high school or college, I did not easily mingle or join in much with my fellow students. I was awkward and lacking in self-confidence around non-disabled people. I warmed up and made friends, though, as I gradually got to know people 
and developed more assertiveness in advocating for my own needs. I had to overcome embarrassment to ask for help to get around campus or to get a, a tray of food in the dining hall. Most difficult, I think, involved dating. Whatever confidence I developed in dealing with my fellow students in high school or college evaporated in, de in dealing with girls. Now, I know that all teenagers go through dating anxiety to some extent, but looking back, I can see that I put an extra heavy burden on myself. Going on a date was painful because I had such limited mobility and very little money and not a lot of imagination to compensate. Often expecting rejection, I wouldn't even ask. I struggled for years advocating for myself with myself. I was not very successful in persuading myself that I was okay, that I was possibly good dating material. Thinking back, I can say that these angst-filled years might have been easier if I had had a peer mentor, someone with a disability around my age who had had similar experiences. Now this was a time before any laws to protect the civil rights of people with disabilities. And an interesting thing about post-polio rehab was that it had drilled in the need to be independent, to overcome our limitations, to adapt to the barrier-filled world. We tried, but often it wasn't enough. We had to learn to persuade, to argue, demand, to try to get what we needed. When I entered the working world after college, getting hired by the Globe and Mail in Toronto for, as a journalist, it was relatively easy. The paper had hired me before as a summer intern, before graduation, and invited me back full time. But finding an, a, an accessible place to live and transportation to and from work were great obstacles. I finally did find a place to live but needed help to get in and out of the building, three steps. I needed a daily taxi ride to work and a driver who could get me down the steps, lift me into the cab and put my trunk, a chair in the trunk of his car in all kinds of weather, including snow. It was a daily battle to get this accomplished and it got more difficult as time went on and more and more taxi drivers knew what was waiting when the taxi driver or taxi dispatcher sent out the order. It wears you down. Not only was the job, my very first job, intense, but these outside stresses were great. But this was no time to wimp out. I was young and persistent. I got better at being assertive, even yelling and getting angry on some occasions. And ultimately, I moved into an apartment with a colleague at work who also had a car and was on the same shift as I was, eliminating most of those difficulties. Later, I decided to return to college for graduate work. I was in Berkeley, California in the 60s when I first learned about a motorized wheelchair coming on the market. I ordered one, but got stuck in a series of broken promises and delays from the manufacturer. Only my aggressive letter writing campaign ended that hold up. I have to say that getting that early model power chair in 1968 marked a great step forward in my independence. And that in turn boosted my confidence. You can imagine the sense of freedom I felt. I could go to class, the library, downtown bookstores and restaurants without having to find somebody to push my chair. Even dating got easier as I had more independence in my environment. Being able to roam outside independently, really for the first time, also made me increasingly aware of and frustrated by the obstacles and barriers rampant in the built environment. I began to see, like other people with disabilities, that I wasn't the problem, the environment was. There were no curb ramps then. To cross the street, 
you had to go down driveways in the middle of blocks. There were steps everywhere, often just one at the door of some establishment, but enough to make access impossible. In 1968, I returned to Toronto to work at the Toronto Star. Finding a relatively accessible apartment and living on my own, finally, for the first time, I found an independent guy with a van with ramps who became my mainstay transit to work. Living downtown was great, but frustrating because of the many access barriers. Another wheelchair user in my apartment building and I became friends. And we heard about a tiny band of people in a local home for people with disabilities who did not like the rules that they had to live with. They were trying to organize to push for more independence and generally more disability rights. My friend and I got involved. And out of that little group emerged a big goal to get the city of Toronto to install curb ramps throughout the city. Anthropologist Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small grant group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So we got a sympathetic member of city council to support us. And she helped us develop a strategy to counter all the inevitable objections over cost and need. So we met quietly with the bureaucrats responsible for streets and sidewalks. We told them what we wanted, heard their objections, and developed plans to resolve any issues. Then we took it public to city council, which approved the program in 1972 after the bureaucrats had signed off on it. It was an exciting moment for our little group. We all grew more confident. We always believed that we had the right to participate in the community and enjoy its amenities as much as anybody else. And now we actively expected to be able to. In Bolden, we began to tackle the lack of access in public transit. Buses, streetcars, and the subway were impossible for most people with disabilities. We got a grant to put on a weekend conference bringing together stakeholders in the issue. We had panels looking at various modes of, of transit and the problems with each one of them. We developed a mass of demographic data to show evidence of the need for access. It was a very good conference, but sadly it went nowhere. The head of the transit agency at the time said that people in wheelchairs shouldn't go downtown, and he resisted any effort to make his agency accessible. Despite our input and community support, the transit establishment moved for a separate dial ride system that seems to be plagued with problems wherever it is instituted, even today. This lack of success deflated our little group of advocates which gradually lost its energy and direction and faded away. But while we fa failed in the short term, we planted seeds. We created awareness for disability rights and accessibility. Our issues were now on the public agenda. We learned, and it remains true today, that advocacy is a long-term struggle with disappointments and reversals along the way. And we also learned that progress will not happen if we don't act now. Today, advocacy efforts in housing, transit, employment, and civil rights are strong, not only in Toronto, but across the continent and the broader world. In San Diego, where I live now, we met with the mayor and local officials to get the city to spend more money on sidewalks and other facilities to be more accessible. We have held public forums on disability issues and raise our voices in all kinds of other public issues too. We worked, for, worked with architects and developers to ensure that a brand new baseball park not only met but went beyond minimum standards. We have marched in the streets. Across the United States, Groups of people with disabilities 
including many polio survivors, have led protests, demonstrations, and powerful lobbying campaigns to win passage and implementation of federal laws for access. Here are just a couple of examples. In 1977, people with disabilities occupied a federal building in San Francisco for 28 days to demand implementation of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, prohibiting de discrimination and requiring greater access. Long delayed, these regulations were issued within weeks. Section 504 is widely recognized as the first civil rights statute for persons with disabilities. People with disabilities in ADAPT blocked buses on the streets of Denver to get accessible buses. They succeeded. Then they started protesting at National Transit Association meetings across the U.S. and Canada, disrupting the meetings and traffic as well, and even getting arrested. But they won, and we won. Buses are now accessible. Today, ADAPT continues its historic efforts for disability rights in housing, community living, and personal assistance services. The pinnacle, pinnacle of disability rights laws, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, was achieved by the great advocacy campaign led by polio survivor Justin Dart, Jr., who crisscrossed the United States, rallying people to support and advocate both locally and nationally. But we cannot rest on our laurels. Attempts to roll back gains in access laws continue in the courts and in legislative bodies. For example, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Pe Persons with Disabilities, commonly known as the Disability Treaty, was rejected by the Senate in 2012. The Disability Treaty would help other countries develop laws and policies based on the Americans with Disabilities Act. The treaty had wise, has wide support among disability groups, including Post Polio Health International, veteran service organizations, business and faith groups, along with a coalition, coalition of both Democratic and Republican senators. But still it is being held up by a few politicians. PHI's advocacy role goes back to its beginnings. Many years ago, Jenny Laurie began working to end the institutionalization of people with disabilities. She founded Rehabilitation Gazette, which became an internationally known advocacy journal and which grew ultimately to become Post Polio Health International. Known as the grandmother of the independent living movement, Denny Laurie urged people with all kinds of disabilities to work together to end institutionalization and support independence. Ginny's dedication to working together for disability rights continues to drive the work of PHI. And the truth is that advocating together in community also reinforces and boosts our own individual ability to advocate for ourselves. This is a long-term struggle. We have learned that we can work with and for one another to achieve goals, however long it takes. Thank you.